Jesus, we want to thank you, Lord, that we are celebrating a great and glorious day that we, Lord, entered into that moment that we said we belong to you and we surrender our lives to you. And Lord, we want to take hold of more and more of the wealth and the riches and, the, and that which you have purchased for us because of, because of what you went through. So this morning, Jesus, we pray that we would be like those, just a picture you gave me of that windmill, Lord, that just catches where your spirit is moving so that we can draw from the wealth that you have for us. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll move in this place today, that you'll ready our hearts, that we'll be able to receive that which you have for us, to live in, to live in the resurrected life. And to take hold of that for which you took hold of each one of us here for. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, this morning, this, the, the, the message that I've got is the way of the cross. And um, now, I could have spoken on, on all that which, which God has made available to us through salvation. But um, I, wanted to, I wanted to look today at, at at Jesus as our master and the one who's sort of gone before us that has modeled a life for us. Now, we, we're living in a time of great favor, aren't we? We're experiencing time. We, we can sense it. We can sense it in the church. We can sense it in the world around us that there is just great favor on the church of God. God is doing stuff in his people. He's doing stuff in the church. The church is becoming more and more effective Amen. We are seeing more of the Spirit of God moving at this time. There is favor over our lives. What we're also are experiencing is that there has been a release of the prophetic at this time. And a, a lot of people's lives have been prophetically spoken over. People are getting excited about their destiny, um, stuff that God has got in store for us. And there's an excitement that's rising up on the inside of God's people. But what's happened is as the prophetic is being released and, um, you know, that God has got these incredible plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. And, and, and yes, he's a loving, good father. And the things that he has in store for us are amazing. So our eyes can be so fixed on the things that Jesus has made available to us and wants us to come into that we, that we actually start to... Um, we, we get bombarded by, by life, and we wonder, what's happened? Now, who's been experiencing that? That there's these pro amazing prophetic words being speak, spoken over our lives, and then suddenly everything that's in contradiction to those words are happening. One person, two people, three, okay, you, four. <laughs> okay, so yes. It's like God has been speaking these words over our life, but it seems like the absolute opposite is taking place. And the other day I was on the phone to somebody else up on the mountain. Maybe we should have let the children out this morning. <laughs> I was, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm up in the, uh, in the mountains and we're seeing these people and I get a phone call from somebody and, um, and the person is... is is quite distraught. Everything is going wrong in this, in this person's life. He's not in new life. Um, not that that makes any difference. Everybody's going through the same things. But um, I said to him, what were the prophetic words spoken over you? And he started telling me all the prophetic, because he was at that Elam's meeting. I remember him there. And, and, and specifically that incredible words were spoken over his life. And I was saying, what were the prophetic words? And so he started to tell me the prophetic words that were spoken over his life. And then I realize everything he's going up against at the moment is almost in contradiction to the words spoken over him. This inheritance that's in store for him just seems to be sna being snatched away. And so it was just, I mean, I did minister to the guy, but it was just very interesting that we kind of like think, what is going on? What is going wrong? And um, I heard Bill Johnson quote a very, um, a very good scripture in Proverbs 22. If you want to turn to Proverbs 22... And I'm going to read from verse 29. You see, what's happening is we are going through a baptism almost of fire. Yes. 
We don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear that. We want to hear all the good news, isn't it? But the Spirit of God is refining. The Spirit of God is doing stuff in our life and He's working out character. Okay? Now, you see, Jesus grew in favor with man and He grew in favor with God. Now, do you think that we can bypass that? You see, we've got to grow in character. Yes, God has called each one of us. There's an anointing on each one of our lives. But God is working out character. And we mustn't be surprised by the heat that has been turned up in our life. It's a baptism of fire. And He's bringing out a refining and He's bringing out quality. He's bringing out from you a vessel that can be used. So if we back to Proverbs Proverbs 22 and verse 29 says, Do you see a man diligent? I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Do you see a man diligent and skillful in his business? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. All right, it's an interesting scripture. It says, Do you see a man diligent and skillful in his business? He will stand before kings. You see, when... When God calls us, we are kingdom people. Amen. Amen. And He's called us to excellence. And whatever we do, we do excellently because we're of the kingdom. All right? We draw from the kingdom. And so, whatever we do, we do with excellence and pursue excellence. I'm not talking about uh, uh, perfectionism. I'm talking about excellence. Pursue excellence because you will stand before kings, as the scripture says. You will, you will, he will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. You see, that's what the Lord will do. Is As you are diligent and skillful in that which God has called you to, you will stand before kings. We carry on. First, uh, Proverbs 23, and it says, When you... It's interesting that the Amplified Version uh, makes the first two words there in capital letters because it's emphasizing. It's not if you. It's when you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider who and what are before you. For you will, be, for you will put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to desire. Do not desirous of his dainties, for it is deceitful food, offered offered with questionable motives. Weary not yourself to be rich. Cease from your own human wisdom. Okay. Kingdom people are people who pursue excellence. They will sit with rulers. They will sit with influential people. Okay. That's just... The nature of it. Now, people of influence like to have exceptional people around them. They like to have skillful people around them. They like to have excellence around them. Not regardless of their character. You look at Joseph. You look at him before Pharaoh. He was a man of excellence. He was a man of wisdom. And he grew in character and was brought to that place where he could be of an influence. This is why God brings us into the presence of rulers and influential people is so that we can influence their life. Why? So that we can change a nation. Do you understand? God wants to bring us to a place where we have an influence, where we can change nations. But we've got to be very careful where our focus is. All right? Remember, it's the way of the cross. It's the way of the master. We've got to follow the, 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 the pattern that Jesus has laid before us. So he brings us to a place where we can change nations. I sort of think of... Um, last night when, when, when we were at the Orthodox Church at um, Mass, we went to Mass at, at midnight last night, and it was just lovely. There's, everybody is hungry. They are um, fervent. They, they, um, they have a, uh, their hearts are in, a, in the right place. And they're there uh, at the Orthodox Church, and they, and, and they, 
And they're all caught up in this tradition and um, the lighting of the candle and so on. So, you know, it's like there we were in this, this beautiful ceremony of the one candle. Um, then from that one candle, all the candles are lit. This resurrection power that goes out and affects every household. And so we were walking home and people were driving away and walking away, protecting that flame, protecting the, uh, the, the, the candle from going out. They're in their cars. And I just thought it was lovely watching people drive away in their cars, holding the light so that they can get home and, and have the light in their home and, and so on. And I, you know, and I just thought this is a nation that their hearts are in the right place. God wants to save this nation. And there is a desire for them to have the light of Jesus Christ in their homes. Not just the symbol of the candle, but the hope of glory, the light of Jesus Christ abiding on the inside of every single one of them. And my heart's desire is that God will catch us this morning and start to stir up on the inside of our lives that we will be a people who have a, 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 a heart for this nation. Because how is God going to use us in a nation if we don't have a heart for this nation? And he wants to bring us in the presence of influential people so that we can change a nation. So yes, excellence brings us here. And we sit at the table of the rulers. But when we sit at that table, we've got to watch our appetite. You see, many, there will be many prophetic words spoken over people's lives of what God wants to do in your life and he, great resources that he wants to release for the kingdom and so on. It's a very scary place because we've got to watch our appetites because it's not for us. Okay, remember, we've got to be, we've got to be single-minded. We've got to be kingdom-focused. We've got to be people who sleep, drink, and eat the kingdom of God. Amen? Our hearts have to be after the kingdom. In the same way as Jesus, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. All right, his, his sole purpose was to see the kingdom of God established here on earth. And he wants that in our heart too. That his sole purpose, that our sole purpose be to establish the kingdom of God where he has planted us. Um. Costas is not here today. I was reading his blog. He put, he, he put something on the, on, on the church um, Facebook. And I thought, well, I'll go and read his blog. And he was, reading it, he, the, um, uh, he was writing there about doubting. And he, and he wrote something about, is Jesus a con man? And um, he says, how can he be a con man? Because con men are always looking for their own interest, aren't they? And um, if you've got so much influence, what is your interest going to be is to try and manipulate those people around you. I mean, he would have been a very, very rich man if he was a con man. But he was a man that was just giving everything away. Everything away. He never kept anything. He traveled lightly. He released all the time. Jesus was not a con man. Now, if we look, if we turn to uh, Mark 10, okay, it's about the rich young, young man, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell at his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's amazing. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Because what he's about to ask him comes from love, and not because he's looking to see this guy suffer. Okay, what God is asking from each one of us is because he loves us so much. Jesus is not asking us to let go of anything because he wants, to, wants us to live in poverty. He doesn't want us to let go of anything so that we have a miserable life. 
Everything is from a motive of love. So it's so important. He says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for, a, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, those who, just, those who don't know, that small little door on the side of the great, great gates of the, of the city, after hours, the great gates were closed. There was only a small little door on the side of the city. And so if the camel came in late and, and missed the time of the gates, he would have to strip everything off the camel, and the camel will literally have to go down on its, on its knees to, to try and get through this little door. That little door was called the eye of the needle. The camel would have to strip himself of everything to get through that door. Okay, So it's not a literal eye of a needle. Okay, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. It's just funny. What was Peter compared to this rich young man? He says, We've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields with them, persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. It's interesting. You see here, Jesus is saying, okay, You've got all this, let it all go, and I'll give you hundredfold. That's really what he's saying, isn't it? He says, you've got all this that you're hanging on to, and you're holding on to with dear life. He says, but if you give it, if you give it, if you let it go, I'm giving a hundredfold in exchange. I'm giving you a lot, lot more. But we don't see it that way, do we? We just hold, we, we hold on to everything because of fear and unbelief. See, Jesus is checking our hearts. He's checking our motives. He's refining us so that he can present us. He's refining us so that we can be presentable as ambassadors of Christ where he places us. To change cities and nations. See, God's not interested in minor harvests. All right? We've got to change our perspective a little bit. It's great to see the ones and twos saved, but the Lord is not interested in the minor harvest. He wants to see this nation saved. Okay? He wants to see the city transformed. Amen? Hello? Amen. Amen. He wants to see the city transformed. All right, he's put you here for a reason to change this nation. And we've got to lift our perspective and see greater things. We've got to lift them to, great, to, to a greater expectancy. See, God wants to change, um, He wants to do stuff in your life so that He can refine you so that you can sit with rulers, you can sit in a place of influence. Can a nation be changed in a day? One person believes a nation can be saved. Can a nation be saved in a day? Amen. See, promotion is not for self-gratification. When God puts you in a place and He starts to promote you, it's not for self-gratification. When you start getting promoted, start getting excited because He's putting you in a place where you can be more effective for the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. It's not about you. 
When he promotes you, it's not about you. It's so that you can be in a place of influence. It's about the kingdom. It's to bring you to a new measure of bringing him glory. See, as with the rich man, God is looking for us to hold on to things loosely. To live a life where we hold on to things loosely because our perspective is the kingdom. That's a challenge. It's a challenge to me. To start looking at that which is around me and just start holding on to it very loosely. There's only one way into the kingdom. There's only one way into the kingdom and it's absolute abandonment to Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one way, and it's absolute abandonment. And it's Him alone. There's no other way. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Everything else, you should be just willing to drop. It's Jesus alone. Abandoned for His complete work in your life. And that's just an attitude to take on this morning. I want you to take on that attitude. Just start to think about it. Meditate a little bit on that. It's Jesus and allowing Jesus to have his absolute way in your life. (coughs) Excuse me. You see, we don't play Jesus. We don't say, I'm going to try Jesus out for a little bit, see if it benefits me. We don't play Jesus. All right. It's about absolute abandonment, completely, or there's no kingdom life. Okay? No kingdom life. You can play Jesus, but there's going to be no kingdom life. You're not going to come into the wealth of that which the Lord has in store for you. You're not going to tap into the things of the kingdom. It's not a cheap gospel. Amen. It's not a cheap gospel. Who's watched the passion? Who was affected by the passion? It's not a cheap gospel. What Jesus did was not cheap. The price he paid was not cheap. And so it's not a time to mess around in the kingdom anymore if you want to take hold of that which the Lord has got in store for you. The Lord is challenging us to an abandonment to Him, abandonment to His ways, an abandonment to say, I want to seek the kingdom of God first. And let His kingdom come in my life. Let His kingdom come in my life. Because He's refining you. He's refining you. He's refining you so that you can stand before rulers and be in a place of influence. And change. Amen. Amen. What you guys are going through. Is so that you can change a nation. I mean how did we get there in the first place? It was the cross. Amen. It's the cross. And Jesus gave himself to be crucified. He did not raise himself from the dead. I'm going to repeat that. Jesus gave himself to be crucified. He did not raise himself from the dead. See, he relinquished everything to be crucified. It was the Father by the Spirit that raised him from the dead. It's the way of the Master. Okay? No servant is greater than the Master. And so if Jesus is in a place where he gives himself to be crucified, to lay down his life, then what is the way of the servant or the disciple? It's the same, isn't it? Sorry, is this stealing your joy? (laughs) (laughs) 
You see, you can't, get to the, you can't get to the resurrection life, you can't get to the glory if you don't first go through the cross. And that's what the Lord is doing in our lives. And we're sort of like, hold on, but he's got all these amazing plans for me. He's got these plans to prosper in me and not to harm me, plans to give me a hope and a future. And it's, you know, but why am I missing it? Why is everything going so wrong? Right, you need to just be willing to have yourself shaped and characterized. It's taking up our cross daily. It's daily taking up our cross because it keeps our focus in perspective, isn't it? It's like, yes, it's the way of the cross. It's, it's, it's holding on to things loosely. It's me not trying to have this orphan mentality where I just hold on to everything, too scared to let go because I'm going to have nothing. The Lord says, if you let it go, I will, I will bless. If you are willing to let it go, I will bring forth the hundredfold. But it's first the abandonment to Jesus. It's no, I, I want the inheritance without all the abandonment. Yeah. It's I want all that nice stuff. I want the, the happy stuff first. Just to see if it's all worth it. And then if, I, if I'm experiencing uh, the absolute goodness of God and everything like that, then yeah, then maybe I'll give my life more, more to him. I want to test him first. Jesus is not to be tested. It's a total abandonment and then he promises. Amen. I lay down my life. He raises it up. I prefer others. He exalts me. And that's the heart mentality, is to put yourself above others. At that place of the table in Luke 14, verse 8 to 11. So you know, if you rush to put yourself at the top of the table, you're going to be humiliated and asked to move. See, the thing is, when we, when we prefer ourselves, we're going to lose. When we put others first, that's when God exalts us. You will lose your place of influence if you're trying to promote yourself. And so the Lord is saying, just lay down your life. Pursue me. Let me work in your heart. Let me work in your life because I will exalt you. I will raise you up. I will lift you up. James 4 and verse 10 says, submit yourself, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. He promotes. And if you can maintain the same uh, priorities in your life when you've just got a little, and when God starts to entrust you with much, what has changed? The priority doesn't change. The much changes. The quantity changes. But don't let the priority in your life change. Because when the Lord tests you with a little, He's testing your priorities. He's testing where your focus is. Because when He is sure that your focus is in the right place with the little that He's entrusted you with, then He knows that if I add more to that, the priority stays in place. And this person is not going to pursue his own gain. But I can entrust him with the wealth and riches of the kingdom for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. And that's the way of the cross. I'm going to stop there this morning. And I hope you're encouraged. (laughs) I want us this morning just to get passionate about the kingdom. To get our focus on the kingdom. And if the Lord is asking you to let go of certain things, it's because He loves you. And because He loves you, He wants to bring you into the much. He entrusts you with the, with the, the ten miners so that He can put you in charge over cities. 
I mean, the, the comparison is tiny compared to what He wants to do in our life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I, I want to pray that as we move out of this place today and we sit with family and we sit in this nation in different places, Lord, I pray that we would be kingdom minded. That our focus, Lord, will be you, not our reputation, not that which we are so scared of losing. Because, Lord, you promise so much in return because you love us. And Jesus, we've got you. We've got you. And we want to thank you. That's more than we could ever, ever ask for or imagine. We've, we've got you. And um, I want to thank you for intimacy with each one of us here. I want to thank you that you bring us into a greater place of intimacy with you. Lord, we want to catch the wind of your spirit. We want to go where you go. And we want to draw from the wealth that you have in store. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>